Good morning, everybody. And thank you for being here. I hear a few of you were out a little bit late last night. And um, I just want to try to keep you awake this morning with a little bit of uh, high energy in our presentation. Um, you know, as Ian said, I think it is so fitting that we're gathered here in Beijing this morning. Because for SAP, as for most companies, China is where the growth is. It's a huge market now, and it's likely to get a lot bigger in the next decade. So I hope you like China because it's clearly the land of opportunity, and you are likely to be spending a lot more time here in the coming years. China is the land of opportunity for your company and many others. I want to make a deal with you this morning. Just for the next half hour, each and every one of you, I want to ask you to step back from your Blackberries, to step back from the list of things that you have to do for your customers. It's long, I know, just, just for half an hour. And to spend some time with me thinking about how the world around you, the world that you're working in, is changing. But I have a bargain for you. For the next half hour, I can promise you there will be no PowerPoints. None. All right, now we've got a deal. So let me get to the big picture. Your business is changing. Your whole world is changing. This truly is the Asian century. The transformation of China is a big part of that. The rise of India is too. And Asia is literally redrawing the global map of trade as we speak. And I want to put all that in context for you. Um, I wrote a book, which I think you're going to get copies of, which is designed to do just that. It's, it's called The Elephant and the Dragon. And I think you're all going to get copies of it later on so that you can use it when you need to make a PowerPoint for your meeting. <laughs> anyway, The Elephant and the Dragon is a story of how India and China are changing their destinies. And with that, they're changing the destiny of the world. And I'm going to tell you a little about India and China today, but I'm going to go further, too, to talk about this entire fast-growing region. But what I want you to remember is this. We must understand how the rise of China and Asia is changing our world. And the reason is, if we don't understand it, we risk being left behind in business. And once we've understood what's happening in this broader context, then we have to be flexible and adjust the approach. What we used 10 years ago or 20 years ago, of course, won't work today. We have to fit into this newly globalized market. And only then can we take advantage of the vast opportunities that are right in front of us. China's economy is coming of age. It's pulling the rest of Asia along with it. That's changing the world, and that means we also need to change. Let me start with India and China, because they're both fast-growing nations, as you know, with more than a billion people each. To me, India is like an elephant. Slowly but surely, it's trudging into the future, where China is flying fast like a dragon. India is taking this slow but steady approach, and it's such a contrast to China's rocket-like rise. And I've covered both, both countries in my book, but in so many ways, it's not fair to group them together because they're such opposites, as opposite as Gandhi and Mao. India's democratic, China's authoritarian. India's capitalist, but often anti-business. China is communist, but pro-business usually, unless, of course, you're Google. Uh, India and China look completely different. How many of you have been to India? And for how many of you is it only the first trip to China? First of many, no doubt. A few. So many people are familiar with China. Well, just briefly for those who aren't aware, India and China look completely different. Beijing is a little bit gray, as you see, whereas India is this riot of bright colors. 
It's a cacophonous nation with 30 different languages, including English. Its airports and its roads are unbelievably shabby. Its time zone mystifies outsiders because it's a half hour off from almost every place else in the world. So at 9 in the morning in Beijing, it's 6.30 in the morning in Bombay. What country does that? Compared with China, India looks really chaotic. But while outsiders see the chaos, they often miss that India has unseen strengths. It has an invisible human infrastructure that is the nation's mighty resource now that it is reconnected to the global economy. And that's one reason India has been such a source of service sector jobs. By contrast, China is straightforward. The national language is Mandarin, clocks line up with the rest of the world, and no doubt about it, the Communist Party runs the country. China looks very strong on the outside. Its brand new highways and airports are a marvel, and they certainly contrast with India's shoddy infrastructure. And it is truly, truly amazing to think how far China has come in just one generation. A generation ago, China was in the midst of the depravities of the Cultural Revolution. Some of you in this room or your families may have experienced those incredible hardships that seem hard for us today to imagine. Today, all we have to do is look outside to the bird's nest to be reminded of China's coming out party, the Olympics. Think about how much this country has changed in 30 years. It's remarkable. India and China may be opposites, but what they have in common is exactly that. Their transformations are powerfully changing the world for all of us. And just to put these in historical context, one of the many people I talked to in preparation for my book was Robert Rubin, the former US Treasury Secretary. And he says the rise of Asia is the greatest challenge since the emergence of the United States more than 100 years ago. This is tectonic economics. That's what we're living through. And what I mean by that is right before our eyes, we're seeing this incredible geopolitical and economic and business shift, one of seismic proportions. The economic successes of India and China are straining environmental resources already stretched thin by developed countries like the United States. That's something we saw vigorously debated at the Copenhagen climate talks just last month. And the increased demand for natural resources, from oil to copper to, most recently, food, has led to higher prices around the world for commodities. And I think you'll see that continue this year even though it's produced generally lower prices for consumer goods. The newfound strength of China in particular is dramatically altering geopolitics. I want to spend a moment on this because I think it's so important. You see, Asian countries that used to export each directly to the West now often make components rather than finished goods, and they send those parts to Chinese assembly lines where Chinese workers snap them together with other parts and send the finished products on to their final destination from China. This is quite familiar to all of you. We see it all the time. It makes the world much more efficient and lowers prices around the world. This is a good thing. The volume of exports from Asia to the West is about the same as it was five to 10 years ago, but the shipping manifest are very different. And that's important because it means that all across Asia, nations all around Asia that used to have the US as their biggest trade partners now have China. They have a new economic big brother. And the reason that's important is because as business patterns change, nations gain or lose economic power, and military alliances also shift. You're in the midst of that happening, and the beginning of that happening, and it's the first big change in geopolitics in this area since in the post-war era. Take Japan. For decades, Japan's largest trading partner was the United States. Now China is Japan's biggest trading partner. 
For decades, Japan was the world's second largest economy. But this year, it's expected to lose that spot to China. Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama says, very simply, the era of US-led globalism is coming to an end. That's the very big picture that we all are coming to terms with. And it's not just Japan. Further south, longtime American ally Australia avoided the recession that hit most of the rest of the globe after the global financial crisis two years ago. And it did that by turning itself into China's mine shaft. China is now Australia's largest trade partner. It bought $83 billion in goods from Australia last year. And like Japan, Australia is now economically dependent on China rather than the United States. So the more iron ore, coal, uranium, and natural gas that Australia sells to China, the more Canberra's security interests also line up with Beijing's. The story is the same around the region. Trade between China and South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and other nations is also growing fast. More and more white-collar workers have headed to mainland China from Taiwan and Hong Kong, and many companies are turning to technology to replace the talent that's literally flowing across the borders there. And meanwhile, trade between China and Southeast Asia's ASEAN member nations skyrocketed from 60 billion in 2003 to 200 billion by 2008. And this year, with the new ASEAN-China Free Trade Agreement, intra-Asian trade should grow even more. And the reason I bring that up is that many of these nations who now rely on the US Navy to protect their shipping routes are increasingly looking to China for security as well. And that's putting pressure on military alliances that have stabilized Asia since the end of World War II. Even South Korea is pressuring the US military to leave despite ongoing saber rattling from nuclear armed North Korea. So the post-war security alliances in Asia are in flux because of the way that global trade patterns are changing. I know this isn't an issue to deal with day to day in your business, but I wanted to put it on your radar screens because it's very, very important for this region and the world, and you are going to see a lot of developments on this front in the next five years. There's one other thing that we haven't talked about yet, which is that with both India and China open for business, more than a billion workers, that's one of every four in the world, most of them earning dramatically less than Westerners, have suddenly been added to the world's labor pool. In other words, we didn't used to have a global job market, and now we do. And that means that no longer can Westerners expect to earn 10 times more than everyone else for the same work. As you know, India and China each have more than a billion people, and they have increasing numbers of college graduates. In India, 2.7 million kids graduate from university each year, and China graduates 6 million every year. Each of these Asian giants adds more college graduates to their workforces each year than the US and Europe combined, by far. And because technology connects that well-educated workforce to the West, Australians and Americans and Europeans can no longer expect to be paid 10 times more than everyone else. That's the bottom line for the labor market. Multinational companies are taking advantage of this new development. They're expanding overseas. The entire world is being forced to adjust to this new workplace reality, and it's brought great efficiencies, not to mention lower cost to many, many companies around the world, but it's also displaced quite a few workers in the West. It's something really important for us to understand as we grapple with how to knit the global economy more closely together in the coming years. And by the way, it's awfully good you're here today because for global business executives today, an understanding of India, China, rise of Asia is considered just as essential as an understanding of accounting used to be. And I think you'll see that wherever your career takes you in the world. Why is this? 
two reasons. The first is the growing acceptance of outsourcing and offshoring, which we touched on a moment ago. The second is far more basic and goes to the bottom line, growth. India is growing four times faster than the United States. And China is growing even faster. So multinational companies that want to please their shareholders are counting on fast growth in Asia. And they're no longer just count concentrating on selling to consumers or companies in Germany or the US. This is especially important for those of you in this room, of course. It isn't your imagination that the projects you're working on are getting more complex and crossing more and more borders. Most of them, somewhere along the line, will touch China as well as other Asian countries. Um, let me just give a couple of examples. Take one of the biggest projects out there today, Boeing's new 787 Dreamliner. It's an incredibly complex project has parts made in lots and lots of countries, related services as well, coming together literally from Japan to Canada to the United States. The Dreamliner's rudder and part of its tail are made here in China. The high-tech floor beams on the plane are built for Boeing in India by the Tata Group. Think how complex that project is. There are thousands and thousands of parts in the average car, much less plane. And the whole Dreamliner project and many, many other similar cross-border corporate collaborations out there are really about figuring out how, the global econ how to get the global economy to work together. That's what you do. You do it every single day. But you probably don't step back, put the BlackBerry away, and think about it in quite that way. These projects would have been entirely unthinkable, not just 20 years ago, but 10 years ago. During that time, the way business has changed is not unlike the way that China has changed. I don't know how many of you were in China 10 years ago even, but China has literally metamorphosized from a nation of farms to one of factories and skyscrapers. This country was 95% peasants in our lifetimes, and now it's certainly not. Of course, there are some ways in which China has a long way to go. But nonetheless, China now exports in a single day, a day, more than it exported in the entire year of 1978, which, as you know, is when China began to modernize and reconnect to the world and turn to capitalism away from communism. So China has just gone through an industrial revolution right before our eyes. And that's given millions of Chinese peasants, hundreds of millions, steady jobs that didn't exist even a decade ago. It's given millions of Europeans and Americans lower prices. It affects us every single day, and that's what I mean about tectonic economics. So as you can see, there are tremendous opportunities for business and for workers all around the world as a result of the rise of India and China and their reconnection to the rest of the world trading system, as well as the technology that connects those workforces and companies in the East to companies and consumers in the West. There's something else very important that's happening here in Asia, and that is that now that China and India and other countries like Vietnam have chosen to change their destinies, to move towards capitalism, and to reconnect with the world, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of abject poverty. We're reminded of it when we see images on TV like that of the devastation of Haiti right now, just how awful poverty is, not to mention a national disaster, a natural disaster. But we forget that this very nation, which now is building avant-garde buildings for the Olympics, like the, the swimming cube and the bird's nest, was a nation of people subsisting on less than a dollar a day, less than a dollar a day just a few short years ago. 
I think that for me, as someone who's seen firsthand a lot of the changes brought on by globalization, that is the most heartening argument for it. People in the West do worry about losing their jobs or lowering their pay, but I see the rise of the poor in Asia as such an incredible plus. For how many decades of aid programs have we as a world tried to bring prosperity to desperately poor people when bringing business to them and connecting them to the rest of the world accomplished that goal much faster? It's an enormous achievement and one that we don't stop to think about because we participated in it, in it every day and as a result we take it for granted. But we're here today to step back from our usual busy lives and to think about these important issues facing the world. And today I ask you to think about this. When it comes to India and China and to many other nations in Asia, we're watching these two giant nations lead Asia in embracing both globalization and capitalism at the same time. What we're witnessing is incredibly unusual. And it comes at a time, fortunately, when we have these hyper-connected global markets. So I don't know how many of you have been to Xi'an in China to see the terracotta warriors. Anyone? You guys need to get out more. The reason I bring it up is that was a point on the Silk Road, the ancient trade route that linked Asia uh, from China to India, then to the European markets and the Gulf. Imagine if the massive trade flowing over the Silk Road were combined with that of the Spice Route, and that mix of global commerce were supercharged with modern technology, and that's really what you've got today. So today, what India and China sell to the West no longer is carried on the backs of camels or aboard sailing ships, but on cargo flights and container ships and even over the internet. It's an extraordinary development, but it brings me to a really important business trend that relates to all of these big picture topics we've covered. I discuss it in the book and I call it the disassembly line. What I mean by that is I want to hark back to the last time there was a business revolution of this magnitude. The last time was Henry Ford's assembly line for cars, invented more than 100 years ago. And this change is particularly important for multinational companies like yours, particularly ones that specialize in connecting your customers to this uh, new process and network. So 100 years ago, Henry Ford brought all the raw materials and components needed to make a car into one place. He lined up the workers in a straight line. He had each of them manufacture or install a single piece until they had cooperated to make a whole car. So iron ore brought to one end of a factory in Detroit came out the other end as a finished car eventually. At the time, of course, this was a revolutionary uh, development that made working so much more efficient. And today it seems quaint, doesn't it? Well, now everything has changed because Henry Ford's assembly line has shattered into a thousand pieces and it's scattered all around the globe, just like it did for the Boeing Dreamliner. This new system that I call, the I call it the disassembly line because it occurred after companies rushed to lower cost by breaking down their products into the most simple, uh, cheap assemblies and sub-assemblies. And by the way, they're now breaking down services in the same way. And now, much of the world's final assembly of goods takes place in China. And that's why the global trade patterns are shifting so dramatically. The result of all this specialization by companies, literally picking where along the value chain they add the most value and doing just that, and sending the rest of the work out to a vast, distant, disassembly line around the world and outside of the company. Um, 
the result of that is one reason the global trade patterns are shifting. And the result of all that specialization is lots of companies no longer make what they sell or they no longer sell what they make. Today, some of the world's most established companies are counting, are counting on developing country businesses to build the products that they sell. So the industrialized world is busy de-industrializing while the developing world is having industrial revolutions of their own like China has just done. Some of you may know, those of you who are based in Asia, the real masters of this disassembly line art is a Hong Kong company called Li and Feng. Lei Feng, if any of you are uh, from Hong Kong. So Li and Feng not only puts Western buyers together with Chinese factories, but it usually manages the whole supply chain for various goods. Literally anything you find in a Walmart could have been, um, could have been organized and, and managed by Li and Feng, from a, uh, from a lawnmower to a children's toy to a, a DVD player. So these supply chains that it manages stretch far longer than the Silk Road, but of course the goods travel along them much, much faster. Services are a big part of this disassembly line too. Not only do we have call centers from around the world answering telephone calls for customer service uh, for one end of the value chain of companies, but you also have much more meaningful integration, which I suspect you guys work on every single day. For instance, Ind Indian engineers are designing car parts to be manufactured in China, just as those Indian call centers are providing back office workers for American companies, and as computer programmers in Bangalore are writing code for the world's mobile phones and computers. Um, one of the things that stri has struck me in my travels to India and China and visits with companies there is kind of strange. You know, you would think that India and China, because they have so many potentials for collaboration, because those economies are complementary, that Indian and Chinese companies would cooperate on many, many projects and would be a formidable force if they did so. They would really threaten the competitiveness of Western uh, major companies that are, um, are trying to compete with them. In fact, there's something strange. I think because multinational companies have such a long history of operating in different countries, they are actually much stronger at harnessing local resources, even in far away, places far away from their headquarters, to compete in the global economy. So, for instance, some of the strongest players in both India and China, regardless of where their customers are, are the big multinationals. You guys, IBM, um, uh, all kinds of, of big multinationals, Cisco, Philips, those multinationals are actually best so far at taking advantage of the synergies in the global economy. I don't know exactly why it is that, that um, local companies haven't globbed on to that more. I think because they're concentrating on selling to the big markets in the West. But that is a huge advantage for multinationals like yours. The ability to manage tasks and projects across cultures across the globe in a very sophisticated way. That sets you apart from many of your local competitors. So you might want to keep that in mind. This is a hugely, hugely important business trend, this disassembly line. But my favorite example of it is really lighthearted. Could you tell me how many of you have an, I an iPhone and an iPod? Sorry, an iPod. Okay, how many don't have one? <laughs> okay. The reason I ask is, does anyone know where the iPod was invented? Come on, guys. 
California, wrong. England, somebody said England? I wouldn't have thought of that, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice place, but I just don't think of it for inventing iPods. But you wouldn't also expect where it was invented, which is a city in India called Hyderabad. Very interesting city. A little company called Portal Player invented the chip that powers the iPod. They tried to license it to Sony. Sorry, I don't know if they're your client. But anyway, Sony said, no thanks. We'll get it. That was a mistake. Instead, they licensed it to Apple. Apple used that chip. Actually, I have to tell you a story about the company that made it. I visited them some years ago. And their headquarters at the time were in a bungalow in Hyderabad. They said, would you like to see would you like to see our, our computer backup? I said, sure. They opened the door of a closet, and in it was a stack of car batteries, because the electricity frequently goes out across India. And the car batteries were the backup power in case the regular electricity went down for them. And this you know, terribly high-tech company just happened to invent a chip that we all take for granted now as something that literally was used to revolutionize the global music business. So Apple uses this chip that it licenses to create a wondrous new product. It made a lot of money for Apple. But think about this disassembly line. Apple doesn't make iPods. Apple doesn't have any factories. Apple counts on Taiwanese subcontractors to make what Apple sells. And those subcontractors make the iPods in China. Then the iPods are shipped all around the world under Apple's brand name. What did Apple contribute to this equation? Something that seemingly only Apple can, the incredible design and marketing capabilities that it brings to products and the distribution system that it has pioneered. So think of that value chain, if I can take you back to business school for a moment. Apple has figured out what it does best, very best in the whole wide world, and it's sent every other task out all around the world to other companies that do it better than Apple. And that has produced incredible inventions as well as a sharing of wealth around the world and a sharing of work around the world. So I think that in the West, sometimes globalization becomes a hot button issue. People forget that it brings not only prosperity, but also, um, also wealth all around the world. Uh, and that all of us game when that economic pie is enlarged. More and more companies around the world, whether they're in service, the service industry, whether they're in manufacturing, whether they're making cars or computers, are like Apple. They're finding where they fit along that disassembly line. They're specializing in what they do be best. And because the world is now open to them, that, again, is tectonic economics. So in so many areas, business, job markets, geopolitics, the environment. The world is facing these very big changes in this Asian century. And that's being driven by the remarkably fast rise of China, which has created a lot of opportunity for those of us flexible enough to adjust to the inevitable changes that are headed our way. Now, Right now, each of you in this room is at a critical juncture yourselves, one which has led you maybe to a new place here in Beijing, maybe to a new continent, those of you coming from Singapore, and also one that could be the most exciting of your career. The rise of Asia, which you are participating in as we speak, is literally changing the world and rewriting history, rewriting business. 
and you're at the forefront of this historic change, changes that are bringing prosperity to hundreds of millions of people around the globe and knitting the world closer together. I hope it brings you some prosperity too. Thank you very much.